Well, thank you, Teresa, for that very, very kind introduction. Um, let me just say, you know, Vita Voices has actually tripled in size over the last few years, and there is a very strong correlation between our growth and private sector partners like Ann Inc. and many others who are in the room, ExxonMobil, Walmart. When we come together, we can truly move women forward tremendously. So let me just say that I think that any International Women's Day celebration that starts off with three very powerful men from different sectors speaking extremely passionately about women uh, is a tremendous sign for, for the future. And indeed, what I believe is that the world is waking up to a new reality. The reality that women are actually the emerging market. Economists call women the great growth reserve. Just take the Asia Pacific region alone. In that region, they could have actually gained $46 billion to their economy if only they would have invested in women's economic empowerment. You know, what I've come to realize is that we've actually had it backwards all these years. It's not that women need the world's help. It's actually that the world needs women. We've just begun to tap women's full potential. And I know today we're going to be hearing from a number of corporations. We Connect and Elizabeth Vasquez is here. Um, and we've got a wonderful partnership with them to really look at how we can bring women into the global supply chain. I mean, after all, women-owned businesses, they are one-third of those small and medium enterprises in the world, yet they represent only 1% of the global supply chain. And you know, what I've learned in two decades of working with women leaders and entrepreneurs around the world, as Teresa said, in over 140 countries, is that women are not just a tremendous economic force. Women are also a tremendous leadership force. Women are not just another number to be tapped in our economy. Women are actually a different kind of number. Women lead differently. And what I would argue is that that difference is precisely what our world needs today. Just look around the world. We see countries trying to recover from economic crisis. We see growing disparities between the haves and the have-nots. We see people feeling so connected to each other through modern technology, yet very disconnected from their leaders. They need a new model of leadership. And I believe what they need are women. Not just women who are successful business leaders, but women who are successful leaders in our economy, in our society, and in political systems. We need women's leadership because they are inclusive, they are collaborative, and they lead in a more sustainable way. What I've seen is that when we invest in women, they bring others along. They look at how they can pay forward those investments by investing and mentoring in thousands, others, thousands of others. You know, if somebody would have told me just even five years ago, what would be the fastest way? If they asked me, what would be the fastest way to move women and girls forward around the world? I think I would have said that if our government could just turn rhetoric into measurable results, that would make a huge impact. So if we could just take all those beautiful laws that exist on the books to promote and protect the rights of women and provide them greater opportunities, then we could really advance women. But I think what I've come to realize is that the private sector, all of you can be just as powerful, if not more powerful. When the private sector comes into this space, as they have over the last five years, and they really align their philanthropic endeavors to their core business strategies, they can truly change the game for women and girls. With their incentives and reach, they can inspire cultural shift. Cultural shift. If you think about that, just think about an energy company like ExxonMobil saying that actually we believe women are one of the greatest untapped natural resources on our planet. Just think about Walmart with their huge global supply chain, the largest private sector in the world, saying, actually, we're going to launch a 360 initiative to look throughout our corporation and throughout our supply chain and say, we're going to double the number of women-owned businesses that we buy products and services from. That's a game changer. Think about Coca-Cola. They're active in over 200 countries around the world selling their products. They've made a bold commitment, and it came from the top, from their CEO saying, what we're going to do is we're going to invest in 5 million women in our supply chain by 2020. This has huge ripple effects. And indeed, it does begin to shift 
the way that people think about and value women in our society. But it's not just women. As Teresa said at Ann Inc., and of course at Intel and Nike support, we're also looking at how do we raise and appreciate and value the contributions of girls, educate girls, and protect their rights. And I'm so thrilled to be here at the Ford Foundation. I know that uh, Luis has probably gone upstairs to deal with many other things on his agenda. But you know, I think there's probably no more passionate advocate than Luis on the issue of uh, child marriage. When you think about it, I mean, that has huge impact to have you know, the, the leader of this major institution say, you know what, I am extremely passionate about girls having a stronger life and livelihood. So I'm really pleased to join uh, today two leaders from our global network. Because what I've become to, I've, I've began to realize is that if we want to move women forward economically, if we want to build stronger economies around the world, we can't just look at women entrepreneurs. We need to look at the social and legal surrounds. We need to look at women's political leadership and women's leadership in civil society. Uh, one of the things that we've done is launched an initiative or begun to incubate a uh, commitment with CGI, Clinton Global Initiative, and I know that Penny from CGI is going to be here later on today. We've launched this in partnership with WeConnect, and it's really to bring women's voices, women's talents into the global supply chain. You know, I strongly believe that no one organization, no one sector, one no country, community, government can do it alone. The challenges, but quite frankly, the opportunity is too great. So with that uh, in mind, that no one sector, no one country, no one community can do it alone, I wanted to introduce you um, for a brief conversation before we turn it over to the, the next panel, um, to Laura Alonso. She is a parliamentarian uh, from Argentina, and also to Marianne Ibrahim, who is a civil society leader um, and women's activist uh, from Egypt. So I want to start off uh, with Laura and just ask you, most of those people in the audience are certainly from the NGO community, but we have a lot of business representatives here. You started your career as a uh, civil society leader, really pushing the government to foster greater transparency because you knew that corruption was ultimately uh, driving disparities and, and uh, sort of uh, enforcing this cycle of poverty in your country. Um, but you came into the parliament because you wanted to see change. How do you think having more women in political leadership, um, as we've seen some great trends in Latin America with obviously Dilma in Brazil and uh, many years back Michelle Bachelet in Chile. How do you think women's political leadership actually can help to drive greater economic stability and why businesses ought to care about making investments in pol women's political leadership? Well, thank you for your question and thank you for having me here. This was a surprise. I, <laughs> I knew about this last night. <laughs> and thank you for the foundation. <laughs> Because uh, I, I was, my, my organization or the organization I worked for many years ago uh, was um, uh, was benefited by by Ford Foundation many, many years in Argentina. So I have to say thank you for, for that ciudadana in my country. And uh, well, women are vital, you've said that. And throughout the world what we have seen is that a lot of progress has been made, but also we see a lot of setbacks. And from my point of view, uh, I have always pushed on to political systems because I think that there will not be change if political systems do not guarantee for businesses, but also for women, men, children, and forever, rights and, and duties and their happiness in life. So in a way, I think that if we are discussing about women's development, women's inclusion in the economic market, social development, economic development, we need also to discuss, and this is also a matter for business and private sector, not only for politicians, we need to discuss the rules in which we are being governed and how we choose and elect those who are making decisions for us. So if, uh, let me just argue that from my point of view, all these efforts can become uh, a real trend for change if we have a better and bigger impact 
in our political systems. And I am saying that democracy is the driver for change, but we also need to adjust democracy when, where we have democracies and we need more democracies where there are no democracies. So I think that women in, in that, um, that change are vital because we've seen many successful cases where women lead in politics that can really change and can and really fight against those issues that men uh, do not fight against. And I have to say that, but if we see Michelle Bachelet, not my president, but if we see Michelle Bachelet in Chile or President Dilma Rousseff in Brazil, Dilma is fighting against corruption inside her government and inside her party so fiercely that any man will never do what she's doing. She's saying no to corrupt, not no co to corruption, no to corruption in my party, no to corruption in my government. Go to the courts and explain to the people what you've done. And if you are uh, the one to blame, you go to jail. This is a woman president of Brazil. So, uh, and I want also to speak a bit, one minute about corruption, because we are speaking here about businesses and about women's inclusion in the economic markets, and in the end, we are speaking about how to reduce inequality gaps. And if we uh, go on letting corruption grow in many countries, what we are discussing here is just a dream and will not come true. So that's why I'm speaking about also the commitment of the business sector. Business sector cannot uh, let itself be, how can I say that, be um, soft with corruption. We see that in Latin America. Latin America is the most inequality. We are very rich region, but very unequal. And we are in unequal because many times the business sector is also ready to tango with those corrupt officials that mm -hmm. steal money from the people. So we need you to include women in the workforce, include women uh, doing a lot of the things that they want to do in their careers, their personal lives and whatever, but we also need business sector to say, as women say, no to corruption, because corruption erodes the trust between human beings, erodes the trust between these human <coughs> beings that cannot connect with their leaders. So we need a big change, but that's why I brought all these issues. Mm -hmm. Women, corruption, democracy, rights, because I think, and business, and I think it's all connected. If we want to have a better world, we need to see all these little things playing holistically to, to so change Lauren, the game. We, Sorry, it was very long. We have lots of, of research in the area that shows that obviously tapping uh, women's uh, economic opportunities, providing women with training and girls education can spark greater economic growth and development. But there's very little research that shows the positive impact of women's leadership in politics in terms of greater economic growth. But I wonder, I mean, what you see in Argentina and certainly, I mean, you look at a country like Rwanda, 56% of women are lower house of parliament and they have one of the fastest growing GDPs in Africa, which, you know, I think, is there a connection there? Mm. Hopefully. Well, maybe there is, but you know, it's not, and this is important because we have discussed this many times, and that's why you have to read Alice's book by <laughs> Lugorsi, because what she portrays there is not any woman, it's just some women that can lead in business, civil society, or politics with certain traits, with certain features and characteristics. So not all women are horizontal. Mm -hmm. Not all women are uh, transparent. Not all women are um, collaborative. So we need to look for those kind of, kind of leaders in which I think that Vital Voices is investing. And these, I think, are the drive, these women are the drivers for change. So we, of course we need more women in parliaments. My parliament has, I think, like 35% women in Congress. But not all the women have the traits and the features that you've mm. talked about because you've learned this from a lot of women around the world. So we need this kind of leadership and I think that women are, we really take risks. That's why I have brought Dilma Rousseff's example here. 
because you say you know to corruption inside her own party. I have never seen a man or any other woman leading in politics saying, if you did something wrong, go and be accountable for that. So in Egypt, of course, your parliament's now been dissolved. Before you, I, th I know they were quite proud of the 2% of women in parliament before. Um, but women fought shoulder to shoulder with men for greater transparency and democracy, but now women's voices, it appears, are being shut out of the Constitution, um, of, of the public sector completely. And there's been a huge rise of violence against women. So Marianne, maybe you can, can allow us to understand why you think women are quite critical to building a more stable, transparent, and democratic Egypt, and how it is that the private sector can potentially play a role, because I know that the private sector right now is pulling out of Egypt. Thank you so much, Elise, and thank you, Sports Foundation, for having um, us here today. Uh, violence against women and um, minorities are, are always alarming signs that a country is going wrong in to the wrong way. We have seen that in Iran, and we have seen that in, Def in Afghanistan, because these are the signs that the country is not doing right. And it's always the, the, the minorities and the women who suffer first. Any autocratic regime, especially with a religious agenda, target women first. Women's part public participation or participation in the public life how women dress and how they act and how uh, they are treated in public life are always signs of uh, prevailing or winning. If more women are not joining the public life, this is a winning sign for those who believe that women shouldn't, shouldn't be participating in public life, that women shouldn't be leading. And we have seen that in our regime currently and before the parliament uh, was dissolved and those even 2% were actually uh, uh, 10 members of the, of the parliament. Four of them were appointed, uh, um, sorry, two of them were appointed and four of them came from the ruling party. So th this leaves a very few women that were actually chosen by their constitu constituents. And this is very dangerous because they are autocratic regimes usually target women first. I have seen and, and lived good success stories and very unfortunate stories where women who tried and fought to be economically and financially empowered uh, were attacked and uh, there were a lot of attempts to fail them. And, and this because the more empowered women are, the more potential that they become leaders and they and this is what scares autocratic regime. In the most rural and tribal parts of Egypt, women who are financially independent are more empowered and they set their own rules and they encourage uh, more women. Um, I remember this woman and she has been in the media uh, recently. She, uh, uh, she had two children and she was recently divorced a few years ago and she decided to uh, build a small factory in her uh, village to make carpets. And she decided to invite other women from the village to work for her when she started expanding. And she paid them more, of course, because all of them were women. And she set the rules if to tell her workers, if you are more educated, if you can read and write, I can pay you more. And if you are illiterate and you start working for me, and then you joined uh, a program to, to learn how to read and write, I will pay, I will raise your, your salary. And that was, and this woman was not an activist. She was not a politician. She didn't have any training whatsoever. It was, it was just, she was just a natural leader. And this scares the men in her village. And they, they waged a campaign to make her fail. So, and this takes me to the, uh, the second part of your question, because we can go forever talking about the unfortunate uh, incidents in Egypt at the moment where major companies are, are, are falling out. We have been sending warning signals for two years that something is going wrong. Wim violence against women came first before all that violence broke in, in uh, all, all over the country. We were, we were sending uh, warning signals that this government, this regime, that dealing like this with women 
is not going to be stable and that's not going to um, uh, stay forever. Anyway, what I believe is very important in the future of, of Egypt and other Arab Spring countries is that uh, with the governments, with the US government doing business with our government and with the major companies who um, some of the names I heard today have huge, huge investments uh, um, in Egypt, it's, it's I think it's very simple. If you are signing a deal or a contract with our government, just put a small clause or a condition that the level <coughs> of workers would be equal to the level of, of women and men in population. We are 54% of the population of 90 plus millions. So I would naturally think that the, the level of workers will be the same in any um, uh, company or any factory or any de business deal with our government. That's, that's easily and it's, it's fair and it, it can easily be done. They will accept it. Also invest, I mean, follow the vital voices model and invest in the future. Invest in young girls. When I was here last year, invited by Vital Voices, and I met a number of the uh, young girls, the uh, American young girls. And actually, when I went back home, we worked together by email to do some projects, and they sent me questions, and they were amazing. And that inspired me that I would love to see this happen in my country. And soon, inshallah, we, will, we are trying to build a program to train young girls, because these are the seeds of, um, of the future. This is the investment in the future. And one last thing is that you can easily, if you have a, a big company in Egypt or a big factory or a business deal, you can train your workers on, 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 on dealing with uh, women issues. You can train your women on knowing their rights. When they know their rights, they are empowered. In Egypt, there was um, that law that if there is more than a certain number of women or female workers in a certain company, the company is obliged to have a daycare for children. And the more women know that, they, they start spreading the, the information. They go and they uh, address their bosses asking for a daycare for their children. So you can easily design, <coughs> with the help of civil society, training programs for your workers in, in the Arab Spring countries to, to, to make them more aware of, uh, of, of women rights and of, um, and, and of the, the laws uh, uh, serving women rights. And finally, get out of the capitals, invest in rural areas and villages. It's cheaper and it, it will make a huge difference with women. Mm. Thank you. Thank you both. You know, I think today as we, as we move forward in discussions around obviously strengthening business through women's economic <coughs> empowerment, I hope that you'll carry both of their voices in your head because I think that if women don't live in communities and countries where their rights are protected, where they feel safe, where they have legal barriers removed so that there are not obstacles to setting up and, and growing businesses, and if they don't live in places where they can truly thrive um, and there's stability and, and greater uh, transparency, we won't reach our uh, sort of collective goal of greater economic empowerment for the entire nation or for women. So thank you so much for, for having me, for allowing us to do this discussion. <clears throat>